welcome to Brushy Fort Baptist Church. We are excited that you have chosen to worship with us, and we look forward to worshiping the Lord uh, together this wet and stormy morning. Uh, but we are thankful for the rain that God has provided, and we're thankful uh, for His countless blessings that He has given us. If you would turn to Psalm chapter 77. Psalm chapter 77 will be our call to worship. Let's look at Psalm 77. I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and He will hear me. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In the night, my hand is stretched out without weary. My soul refuses to be comforted. When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. You hold my eyelids open. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I consider the days of old, the years long ago. I said, let me remember my song in the night. Let, my medit let me meditate in my heart. Then my spirit made a diligent search. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love forever ceased? Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? Then I said, I will appeal to this, to the years of the right hand of the mighty, the most high. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, O oh God, is holy. What God is great like our God. You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your mind among the peoples. You, with your arm, redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and um, Joseph. When the waters saw you, O oh God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, the deep trembled. The clouds poured out water. The skies gave forth thunder. Your arrows flashed on every side. The crash of your thunder was in a whirlwind. Your lightnings lighted up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was through the sea, your path through the great waters. Yet your footprints were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Psalm 77 is written to inspire us to consider how great God is. How mighty is He? I didn't realize it was going to rain so terribly last night when I settled on this psalm. But uh, verse 17 says, The clouds poured out water, the skies gave forth thunder, your arrows flashed on every side. As uh, terrifying as an intense thunderstorm can be, uh, as terrifying as a deluge of rain can be, God is even mightier than each and every one of those things. We need to remember that. We need to consider that. <coughs> the God we serve is mighty, but He's not just mighty, He's loving towards us. What a blessed uh, truth to consider this morning. Let's pray. Father, I thank you uh, for your word. Lord, I thank you for the rains that you've sent. I thank you for uh, the fact that you have promised uh, that you are mightier than the storm. Lord, uh, it is a terrifying thing to be in the way of a destructive force of nature. But Lord, you are bigger than that. And Lord, uh, in many ways, we should be more terrified. And Lord, we would be uh, we would be cowering under a rock looking for something to hide us if not for the message of your love towards us. Lord, uh, Jesus told us that while we're yet sinners, you love us. Lord, and we thank you for that. We thank you for your love that, uh, that you have poured out through your Son. You have given us and shown us the depth and and width and breadth of that love by, uh, by sending your one and only Son to live the life we couldn't live and to die in a, a sacrificial death on our behalf. Lord, we thank you for the truth of the gospel. Lord, we thank you for uh, the truth of your word. And Lord, I pray that it would encourage us and guide us and direct us and lead us. And Lord, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.
turn to Ezra chapter 10. Ezra chapter 10. Aren't you glad God gives us, uh, aren't you glad that God gives us uh, the tools to handle really hard ethical questions? Um, I'm sure that you have uh, heard on the news and, and seen in the newspapers the reporting about uh, uh, the 10-year-old girl from Columbus, Ohio. Uh, that has become the, the poster child of the, the pro-choice um, movement. And uh, I don't want to belabor that. I mean, we, we recognize that what happened to her was horrific. They've arrested uh, the man uh, that abused her, and he will face trial. And uh, if he is guilty, I hope he is convicted. And uh, the full brunt of the weight of the law is upon him. Um, but... I use this as an illustration because in Ezra chapter 10, we have a, a moral question that is upon us, and, and we have a moral dilemma, and here uh, we have from our own culture a very real and present moral quagmire, the very fact that a nine-year-old, now a ten-year-old, was pregnant and had an abortion is quite astounding. It's, it will take you aback, but yet um, the doctors that I've heard uh, interviewed uh, said that uh, if she has gone through uh, puberty and is able to, to uh, conceive a child, then, then her body would, uh, there's no health defect that would keep her from bearing that child. So our culture then moves to the question, okay, is it right to force a 10-year-old to have a baby? Now, we all recognize that this is not optimal. This is not a good situation. This is not what God intended. There was violence done to this little girl beyond her control. And uh, we do recognize uh, that there is a problem here, but our culture is asking the wrong questions. In fact, our culture is having the wrong perspective. In fact, the Bible, fortunately, gives us a perspective because our culture is wrapped up with a radical individualism. In fact, uh, it, if it doesn't help you, if it, you don't think it benefits you, then, then our culture says to reject it and put it aside, to, to get away from it, to, to uh, subjugate it to the, to the outermost parts of the realm. And at the center of that radical individualism is an idolatry of our selves. But God lifts up a different understanding, a, a different reality. When God in, in the book of Psalms tells us that he knit us together in our mother's womb, that gives us a message that, that we are all about ourselves. Everything that happens isn't about ourselves. When we read the, the story of Hannah and Samuel, we recognize that it is God who, who opens the womb and it's God that closes the womb. God is the one that is in control and we may not be able to answer why this 9 or 10 year old in God's providence is pregnant and facing this horrific decision. But we recognize that God is in control. And we also recognize that the Bible is quite clear about children from the very beginning. In, in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, the, the Old Testament understanding of children is that each individual child that is born is a fulfillment of that promise. That one day the, the child of woman is going to crush the head of the serpent and he is going to defeat sin forever. Each new child is a question of is this the one? You see, God's perspective is that a child is a blessing. A child is a gift from him. Think about this. Adam and Eve had much concern. After Cain and Abel had their uh, fight and after Cain killed Abel, you can imagine Adam and Eve wondering, uh, should we continue this? But what did God do? He gave them a son, Seth. 
And, and the Bible looks at Seth not as a question of, is he going to be a Cain? Is this a problem? Is this, is this a trouble? But he looks at, at Seth as a possibility, as, a, as an emphasis towards God working. God is a gift. And that's the Old Testament understanding. And after Jesus, we see that in the New Testament, that, that each and every successive child that, that is given, God uh, looks at them as a potential one, as a co-heir with Christ. Each child that is born after Christ has, has, the, uh, has the opportunity, has the, the potential of being one who would place their faith in Jesus and become a co-heir with Jesus. This is a blessing and a gift. So God's, God's rubric for evaluating this ethical quagmire is different than our cultures. The question that, that God is asking is different. Yes, there was a little girl who unexplicably horrific things happened to her, and she is in an incredibly tough situation beyond her control. But yet the message of the Bible is that life is a gift from God. Life is a gift from God. And this also highlights one other point of this ethical question. Our culture would treat that child as a lump of cells that could be taken out like a gallbladder or something like that. Folks, you know how closely I work with Life Choices Clinic. We have post-abortive moms that come in for counseling and help. I know post-abortive moms, it's never a clump of cells. Our culture doesn't evaluate the trauma that is filled. And yes, there would be trauma of that 10-year-old conceiving and bearing that child, but there is going to be trauma if and that child was aborted. There's no way of getting around the trauma. Any choice that is made, there is going to be intense trauma. And, and, and then we may wonder, well, well, this moral decision, how does God even get here? How can God even let this happen? And then we have to trust in his goodness because it is only the God that we can serve that can reach into that circumstance. That girl has no winning option. But God can reach into that circumstance and he can bring healing no matter what choice was made. God's choice would be for that child to live because that child is a gift. But even if she, and she did, probably, obviously, with her parents' consent because of her age, um, that child was aborted. But do you know what? God could reach in, even if she carried that that. Uh, baby to term, God could reach into that circumstance and he could re redeem both of those lives. He could redeem that mom's life. She, it, it, you see, our, our world offers the ability to cope with a problem. The ability to come to terms with that problem. But God gives us the opportunity to set free the captives, as Isaiah says. God is the only one who can heal that girl of the trauma that is there. God can set her free. In fact, Jesus came to this earth to minister to people like that 10-year-old girl. And God can set her free. God can set her free from the trauma of bearing a child at the age of 10 of the trauma of the abuse that she encountered. But God can also set her free from the trauma of that abortion that was conceived. You see, the Bible gives us a vision for how to wade through incredibly challenging ethical dilemmas. We're not going to find many more challenging than the rape of a 10-year-old and the conception of a child and how to go forward from that point. The Bible tells us what we should do, but God reaches down in his grace and can redeem that situation no matter what choice was made. Here in Ezra chapter 10, we face another dilemma that is on par with this dilemma. 
One, as I said before, uh, Ezra 9 and 10 were circled in my mind as I'm going through this, uh, preparing for preaching on Ezra and Nehemiah, because I know uh, the challenge of Ezra 9 and 10. And two weeks ago, we looked at Ezra 9, and we're going to look, continue to look at Ezra chapter 10. So the title of my message this morning is God a Racist Homewrecker? Let's look at Ezra chapter 10. While Ezra prayed and made confession, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, a very great assembly of men, women, and children gathered to him out of Israel. For the people wept bitterly, and Shekinah, the son of Jehiel, the son, sons of Elam, addressed Ezra. We have broken faith with our God and have married foreign women from the peoples of the land. But even now there is hope for Israel in spite of this. Therefore, let us make a covenant with our God to put away all these wives and their children according to the counsel of my Lord and all those who, those who tremble at the commandment of our God and let it be done according to the law. Arise, for it is your task, and we are with you. Be strong and do it. Then Ezra arose and made the leading priests and the Levites and all Israel take an oath, and they would do as he had been said. So they took the oath. Then Ezra withdrew from before the house of God and went to the chamber of Jehonan, son of Elisha, where he spent the night, neither eating bread nor drinking water, for he was mourning over the faithlessness of the exiles. And a proclamation was made throughout Judah and Jerusalem to all the returned exiles that they should assemble at Jerusalem, and that if anyone did not come within three days by the order of the officials and the elders, all his property should be forfeited and he himself banned from the congregation of the exiles. Then all the men of Judah and Benjamin assembled at Jerusalem within the three days. It was the ninth month on the twentieth day. Of the month, and all the people sat in the open square before the house of God, trembling because of this matter and because of the heavy rain. And Ezra the priest stood up and said to them, You have broken faith and married foreign women, and so increased the guilt of Israel. Now then, make confession to the Lord, the God of your fathers, and do his will. Separate yourselves from the peoples of the land and from the foreign wives. Then all the assembly answered with a loud voice, It is so, we must do as you have said. But the people are many, and it is, time, it is a time of heavy rain. We cannot stand in the open. Nor is this a task for one day or for two. For we have greatly transgressed in this matter. Let our officials stand for the whole assembly. Let all in our cities who have taken foreign wives come at appointed times, and with them the elders and judges of every city, until the fierce wrath of our God over this matter is turned away from us. Only Jonah. Je Jonathan, the son of Asahel, and Jehazahai, the son of Tikva, opposed this. And Meshulam and Shabbatiah, the Levite, supported them. Then the returned exiles did so. Ezra the priest selected men, heads of the father's houses, according to their father's houses, each of them designated by name. On the first day of the tenth month, they sat down to examine the matter. And by the first day of the first month, they had come to the end of all the men who had married foreign women. Now there were found some of the sons of the priests who had married foreign women, Messiah, Eleazar, Jerob, and Gedaliah, some of the sons of Jeshua, the sons of Josadak, and his brothers. They pledged themselves to put away their wives, and their guilt offering was a ram of the flock for their guilt. Of the sons of Emmer, Hananiah, and Zebediah, of the sons of Harim, Messiah, Elijah, Shemaniah, Jehiel, Uzziah, of the sons of Pasher, Elioniah, Mas Masiah, Ishmael, Nathaniel, Jezebad, the Elisah, and, and of the Levites, Josabad, Shemai, Keliah, that is Kelita, Pethahiah, Judah and Eli Eliezer of the singers Eliashib of the gatekeepers Shalom, Telem, and Uri, and, and of Israel and the sons of Parash, Ramiah, Isaiah, Malkijah, Mijamin, Eleazar, Hashabiah, and Benaniah, and the sons of Elam, Mataniah, Zechariah, Jehiel, Abdi, Jeremoth, Eliajah, of the, Elijah, of the sons of Zuta, Zutu, Elioniah, Elishib, Mataniah, Jeremoth, Zebab, 
and Azizah. Of the sons of Bebai, Bebai were Jehananah, uh, Hananiah, Zebiah, and Athlai. And the sons of Bani were Meshulam, Meluk, Adonai, Jeshub, Sheel, Jeremiah. Of the sons of Pahath, Moab, Abna, Chelel, Benaniah, Messiah, Mataniah, Bezalel, Benua, uh, Manasseh, of the sons of Haram, Eliezer, Ish, Ija, Milkeja, Shemiah, Simeon, Benjamin, Melech, and Shemiah, of the sons of Hashem, Mataniah, Mat Matanah, Zebab, Eliphet, Eliphet, Jeremiah, Manasseh, uh, Shemiah, of the sons of Bani, uh, Medai, Amram, Uel, Benaniah, Bedadiah, Chaluiah, Venuai, Meramah, Elishim, Mataniah, Matanei, uh, Jeshu, of the sons of Benuai, Shimei, uh, Shelemiah, Jonathan, Ad Adiah, Matnedebiah, Sheshuiah, Shariah, Azrael, Shemiah, Sh Sheremiah, Shalom, Amariah, and Joseph, and the sons of Nebo, Jeel, Mattathiah, Zebab, Zebina, Jediah, Joel, and Benaniah. All these had married foreign women, and some of the women had even born children. That list doesn't get any easier, no matter how many times you read it. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you would give us grace as we uh, look at this chapter. And Lord, I pray that your word would speak to us. And Lord, that we would see that, that it has uh, deep and abiding answers for, Lord, incredibly complex eth ethical questions. So Lord, I pray that as we look at Ezra 10, that you would guide and direct us, Lord, that your spirit would open the truth of your word to our hearts. And I pray, Lord, that we would be... Uh, influenced, and Lord, that our lives would be directed by it. Lord, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Ezra chapter 10, like Ezra chapter 9, prompts us, prods us, encourages us to put every ounce of trust we have in God because he is good. The message of Ezra 9 and 10, as difficult as the circumstances, as challenging as it is to understand what is happening here, what God is telling us, he wants us to know that we are to put every ounce of trust in him because he is good. First, put away your idols and repent. Notice what Ezra does. We talked about Ezra chapter 9, how Ezra uh, leads from example and how he identifies with the people. He takes on their sin. Ezra hasn't married a foreign wife, but Ezra is repenting in such a way that you could not distinguish him from somebody who was repenting of marrying a foreign wife. And, and two weeks ago, we talked about all the troubles, uh, all the, the dangers of why God was protecting his people. It's not that God is Racist. God is not saying that you can't marry any foreign wives. There's a specific type of foreign wife that is at play here in Ezra chapter 9 and 10. And that is a foreign wife that not, has not embraced the, the message of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Has not placed her faith in that. This is a, a spouse. It doesn't just have to be a wife, but it, it could also be a husband. Um, one that has not placed their faith in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We know that because in Ezra chapter 6, uh, God opens up the celebration and the, the worship experience to foreigners who have, have embraced Jesus as their Lord and Savior. In fact, they aren't called foreigners anymore, but they are a part of the people of God. They are part of those who are counted as his people. So we have to notice that, that Ezra is praying and he's confessing. He's weeping. He's cast himself down before the temple of God, the house of God. And notice what happens. A very great assembly of men, women, and children gather to him out of Israel. 
Ezra has taught on the law of God. Ezra has uh, led his people to understand what God has taught. And, and Ezra is repenting when the people come, when the leaders come to Ezra and say, this is a sin amongst the people. Ezra uh, repents and everybody knows, and this draws a big crowd of men, women, and children. It's interesting, the, the wording, the word choice here, a very great assembly. This wasn't just some curious onlookers, but in mass, the people of Israel poured into Jerusalem to see what God is doing in the heart of Ezra. In fact, they, God is moving amongst them too. And what did the people do? The people wept bitterly. They joined Ezra in the expression of the realization of the effects that their sin has had on the people of God. So we see this is a moving visualization of what God is doing. God is moving in Ezra and God is moving in his people. And Shechaniah and this very well may be the Shechaniah that becomes the high priest in a short while in Nehemiah. But we don't know for sure. But he's the son of Jehiel, the sons of Elam. He addressed Ezra. So he is a leader. He's someone that, that the people have, have uh, expressed their confidence. And he was giving voice to what the people want to convey to Ezra. We have broken faith with our God and have married foreign women from the peoples of the land. But even now there is hope for Israel in spite of this. Shekinah, he proclaims exactly what has happened. We have sinned, and we have done this idolatrous thing. We have looked after our own individualism, our own desires. We have seen them as better. And, and remember, what has happened is, is the vast majority of these marriages were by the sons of Israel. And what they have done is, is some of them have even put away their... their, uh, their um, Jewish wives and married a foreign wife for the financial benefit and security that has happened. Some of them have been in that circumstance. We know that from uh, Micah, the book of Micah. Uh, we also uh, recognize uh, that um, God has forbidden them to marry these uh, women who have not embraced him as their Lord and Savior to because it would dilute their inheritance. If they married these women and these women brought them away from their re religion and then they had children and they had sons and those sons were uh, brought up as if they were Canaanite or Edomite or any of the other, other people, then those land grants, those lands that were passed down from the generation, those lands would then be inherited by someone who is not identifying as a Jew but as someone who is identifying as as one of those other cultural identities. In fact, God's nation would be defiled, and in fact, they would have no land if this were to continue. So they recognize that they have sinned against God. And he says in verse 3, Therefore let us make a covenant with our God to put away all these wives and their children according to the counsel of my Lord and of those who tremble at the commandment of our God and let it be done according to the law. Verse 3 is absolutely an amazing verse. Because Shechaniah is giving voice to the desires of the people. Ezra has taught from the law. He's, he's provided counsel, but Ezra has not given them a, thus said the Lord, this is what you are to do. At least we don't have it recorded in his word. But here the people of God have listened to the law. They've listened to Ezra's teaching. They've internalized it, and they recognize there is only one way forward. They have to divorce their foreign wives. And this is what Ezra has been teaching, and this is what Ezra has been moving towards. But the people have embraced that, and they've embraced it because it's in line with the law of God. Many commentators, and, and I read uh, about six or seven commentaries in preparation for this because it, it is so, it, it's so challenging, and they're divided. They, they wonder whether 
This is just a cultural appropriation that Ezra didn't get God's desire right. But I think the text is clear that the people of God are coming to the law, recognizing what God has required. And they are saying, this is what God wants us to do, to put away these wives. The reason that some commentators would shy away from that is because it seems to make God out to be a homewrecker. We're going to address that in a second. In verse 4. Arise, for it is your task, and we are with you. Be strong and do it. Then Ezra arose and made the leading priests and Levites and all Israel take an oath that they would do as had been said. So they took the oath. So Ezra, you can imagine, this isn't some just easy thing that Ezra is saying, okay, uh, you've been worshiping these other gods. We just need to break these other gods, and we need to throw those out in the heat pile, burn them, and be done with this. This isn't that, is it? The prescription for this is that these families are going to be broken up and that these wives are going to be put away, sent back to their families in the, the foreign lands with their children. And uh, these men are going to uh, go forth from this point, or fur, this point further, only looking to the wives or to the women of God's people. This is a challenging thing. So Ezra says, okay, guys. You've come to me and you've proclaimed this prescription. I'm in agreement with it. The, this is what God commands. But this is a hard thing, so I'm going to need a covenant. You're going to have to sign on the dotted line. The people of God come, and they are so committed that they sign on the dotted line. This is what we're going to do, Ezra. God is moving in their midst. They recognize that if sin is in the group, they need to get rid of that sin. They also recognize that at the heart of this sin is an idolatry. They were looking out for their own desires, ignoring the instruction that God had given them. They were looking to something other than God to provide for them, for their happiness, for their well-being, all of that. This is an idol. This is a heart problem. Then look at what Ezra did in verse 6. Then Ezra withdrew from before the house of God and went to the chamber of Jehonanan, the son of Elisha, where he spent the night, neither eating bread nor drinking water, for he was mourning over the faithfulness of the exiles. Ezra is still cut to the heart because he recognizes how painful this is going to be for the people of God. He goes to a private room in the temple. He's there. He's eating and drinking, or he's not eating and drinking. He's fasting through this time, and he's pouring out his heart in prayer for the people and their faithfulness. And then verse 7, And a proclamation was made throughout Judah and Jerusalem to all the returned exiles that they should assemble at Jerusalem, and that if anyone did not come within three days by order of the officials and the elders, all his property should be forfeited, and he himself banned from the congregation of the exiles. Okay, what is this all about? Ezra is bringing all the people together, but, but why do they have this strict, uh, why do they have this strict consequence? Well, you can imagine. I am sure there are people on the fringes of the Jewish community that have foreign wives that don't, aren't really enthusiastic about all the talk that they've heard. And here, what Ezra is saying, that we need everybody here, we need a unified, uh, a, a unified group of people to hear the proclamation of God. And what happens if they don't come is the exact same thing. Uh, they are going to be placed outside of the community. If they don't come... It's going to be like they were a foreigner or a Gentile. Their, their property, property will be confiscated and given over to the family at large. And they would be considered a Gentile, a foreigner. You see, Ezra was dead serious about addressing this issue. Then in verse 9, Then all the men of Judah and Benjamin assembled at Jerusalem within the three days. It was the ninth month on the twelfth day of the month. And all the people sat in the open square before the house of God, trembling because of this matter and because of the heavy rain. You can imagine. They're all sitting in Jerusalem. Can you imagine the solemn thing? They know what's coming. They've, they've heard the proclamation. Uh, I mean, you can't go five minutes 
uh, with someone writing a bill in Indianapolis before it's in the newspapers or something else, right? I mean, you can imagine all the talk that is going on. Everybody knows what is coming. And not only is there a solemn heart, not only is there a rain in their souls, but guess what? It is wintertime in Jerusalem and it's the rainy season and there is a cold, dark rain falling on their heads. You see, the weather is matching their mood. The weather is matching the situation here. God is pointing again to the fact that they have to do something. And then in verse 10, Ezra the priest stood up and said to them, You have broken faith in marriage and faith in married foreign women, and so increase the guilt of Israel. Now then make confession to the Lord, the God of your fathers, and do his will. Separate yourselves from the peoples of the land and from the foreign wives. Then all the assembly answered with a loud voice. It is so. We must do as you have said. But the people are many. And it is a time of heavy rain. We cannot stand in the open. Nor is this a task for one day or for two. For we have greatly transgressed in this matter. Let our officials stand for the whole assembly. Let all in our cities who have taken foreign wives come at appointed times and with them the elders and judges of every city until the fierce wrath of our God over this matter is turned away from us. Only Jonathan the son of Asahel and Jezaziah the son of Tekvah opposed this and Meshalom and Shabbatai the Levite supported them. Then the returned exiles did so. Ezra the priest selected men, heads of the father's houses, according to their father's houses, each of them designated by name. On the first day of the tenth month, they sat down to examine the matter. And by the first day of the first month, they came to the end of all the men who had married foreign women. So what happens? Ezra makes the proclamation. And, and then all the people come to Ezra and say, Ezra, this problem is way too big to handle in one or two days. We need to send the people out and we need to do this in an organized manner. And, and this is not Israel trying to push things down the road to try to get away, to give maneuvering room, to maneuver and to, uh, and to get their way out of this. No, this isn't some political meandering trying to get out from under this declaration. No, this is the people of God recognizing how serious this is and saying they want to do it right. And Ezra relents. And they take two and a half months or so, and they interview each and every family, and they come to a conclusion. And then we get the names at the end of the chapter. So here, the people of God, because of their idolatry, because of turning away from God, they are called to put away their foreign lives. And then we ask the question, and it's probably forefront in your mind. Well, Chris, we've looked a lot at Genesis 1, 2, and 3. We've looked at the purpose of marriage. We've, we've looked how that uh, goes through the, the Old Testament. Isn't this contrary to what God has said in other places? Isn't this contrary to God's will? In fact, many would raise the fact that it is absolutely contrary to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So go ahead and turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and we're going to look at this. In light of Ezra chapter 10. Starting in verse 10 of Ezra chapter 7. To the married I give this charge, not I but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband. But if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And the husband should not divorce his wife. To the rest I say, I am not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is, in an, who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy." But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. And in such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Yeah. 
Ezra chapter 10 and 1 Corinthians chapter 7 seem to be in direct opposition. Ezra chapter 10, the people of God are commanded to put away their foreign wives. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, uh, those that have come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior have, uh, have been called to come to their, to their spouse and say exactly who they are. I'm a follower of Jesus now, and if you will have me, I'll stay. And if you won't, then... Um, then we can separate in peace. But the, the idea of 1 Corinthians chapter 7 is that marriage should not be dissolved. So how do we make sense of this? How do we make sense of these two seemingly contradictory teachings in God's word? Well, we have to recognize what has happened between Ezra and between 1 Corinthians. And something very important has happened. And that's something very important is that Jesus has come. And because Jesus has come, there's been a subtle change. And, and when we look at the Old Testament, the Old Testament uh, points to the fact that the purpose of God for his people is that they would be a light or a city set on a hill, a light that would shine forth to the nations. God per God's purpose is that he would call a, a kingdom of priests to Jerusalem and they would be a holy people. And as they lived in obedience to him, God would pour blessings upon them to the point that all the other nations around them would look at them and say, what is so radical about them? What they have, I want. The people of God were to be an image of God to the people from a very specific place in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was where God dwelled with his people. God's presence was in the temple. All of this was wrapped up in the Old Testament law. So the very fact that, that the very culture of God's people was threatened by these foreign, marrying of these foreign wives... The very fact that their land could be eroded, the very fact that their hearts were taken away, the very fact of all this stuff gets at the very heart and purpose of God for his people. They are to be a light to the world. So in Ezra chapter 10, the very purpose of God for his people trumps in importance the very real marriage that was entered into between these husband and wife. You see, God's glory is more important than an idolatrous marriage. But then something happens with Jesus. Jesus takes on the image of the temple. Jesus is the true temple. Jesus is the promised one. Not, we don't now look to a people of God in Jerusalem to see what God is. We look to our Savior, Jesus Christ. He is the personification of God himself. He is the one who shows us God. And because of that, our mission has changed. Not only, We do not stand looking to Jerusalem to find God anymore, do we? No, because Jesus has come and because he has sent his Holy Spirit, God has taken up residence within us and sent us out to win a people for him. The purpose of God's people has changed from Ezra chapter 10 to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Because now God's people have the temple of God, the presence of God, and they are commanded to go forth and win people for Jesus. And no longer is that idolatrous marriage, a marriage between a believer and an unbeliever, no longer is that marriage a degradation of God's glory, but it is an opportunity for God to win another person. There's been a change between Ezra 10 and 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So Paul God hasn't changed. God's commandments haven't changed. God's disposition towards marriage hasn't changed. God, it, it, as a contemporary, Micah tells us that God hates divorce. God hated divorce in Ezra chapter 10. But God's glory was more important. But now that the focus and the mission has changed, God has relented in that and given Paul the instruction to instruct the people of God that if they are married to someone who does not believe, and in fact, God's instruction has not changed. God's instruction to the church is that they are to look within the body of faith for their spouse. They are to look for someone who has a similar belief system. 
But if they find themselves outside of that instruction, if they find themselves outside of that, they aren't to immediately divorce that person. But if that person is to, is to keep them, if that person agrees to have them, they're to stay married. Why? Because there is a mission. Look at verse 15 of 1 Corinthians chapter 7. But if such case... But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? See, God's direction is not inward, but now outward in his purposes to God, to, his, to winning a lost and dying world. You see, Ezra chapter 10 is not radically opposed to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, but God's purposes have changed because Jesus has come. God isn't a racist. God isn't a homewrecker. In fact, we recognize from Ezra chapter 10 that God recognizes how devastating this is. Why did I read each and every name and not just tell you there's this many names and let you go read them yourself? Because each one of those names or uh, recognizes a family that was broken because of this. God wept over the idolatry and the poor decisions of his people. This did not make God happy. But his people's obedience allowed him to continue to work through them. See, not only do we need to put, ever, uh, put away our idols and repent, but secondly, we need to follow through with our repentance. Each and every one of these names represents someone whose family was broken. Not broken because God had uh, disingenuously swept the rug out from under them. No, they had made their choices. They had chosen to follow an idolatrous path. Yet the prescription was hard, yet the prescription was difficult. And each and every one of these, these men did exactly what God commanded them. This is a picture of repentance. God doesn't call us to easy things. And when we mess up, sometimes the remedy is hard. We have to follow through with God's remedy. There's no political maneuvering with God. There's no way of getting out from under his teaching. No, each and every one of these men had to say, I messed up. I disobeyed God. I endangered the community of God because of my choices. And there was not a family in Israel that was not connected in some way. Not every family married a wife, but inside that family, someone was affected. It shows us in a very real way the cost of sin. But it also shows us in a very real way the love of God. Yes, this is dramatic. This is a radical call to repentance, but God is even merciful in this repentance. This is the end of Ezra. And notice how it ends. All those who had married foreign women and some of the women had even born children. What an ominous ending. The wives were affected and the kids were affected too because of dad's poor decision. But that's not the end of the story because Ezra and Nehemiah was intended to be read as one book. 
we're going to continue with the story. But here in Ezra 10, we see the call of repentance, and we're going to see that God pours out his blessings upon his people because of their faithfulness. It's not the end of the story of calling the Israelites to repentance. There's more to repent of. But this is one giant step for God's people to be in line with God's book. God has the same call for us. Is our life in line with his book? If not, we can't expect his blessings to be poured out on us. We can't expect him to bless us the same way. In fact, our repentance may need to be just as radical even if the consequences aren't as dire. Because we need to be serious about following God and following His word. That's the message of Ezra chapter 9 and 10. Put every ounce of trust you have in God because He is good. And I tell you, the men of Ezra chapter 10, those men that had married foreign wives, it took every ounce of trust to think of God as good. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for all that you have done for us. I pray, Lord, that you would inspire us to be people of repentance. Lord, I pray that we would follow through with that. And I thank you for this passage of Scripture. Lord, I thank you that it opens up to us thinking about the Bible in, in uh, broad spectrums. And Lord, in, and looking at teaching across the canon. I pray, Lord, that uh, that would... Uh, that would be instructive to us. I thank you, Lord, that you give us answers to deep and abiding moral questions. Lord, that we can address these problems of our culture, not just with an answer, but with a hope, the hope of Jesus Christ, that he is the answer. He's the one who can heal. He's the one who can restore lives. Lord, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. If you feel like the Lord is leading you to have a personal relationship with Him, then let me just share with you the best news. To share with you the best news, I have to share with you the bad news. The bad news is that we are sinners, uh, and we fall short of the glory of God. Paul tells us, for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. That means that that relationship in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 that Adam and Eve had, that they had, were in relationship with God, that means that our sins break that relationship. Just like Adam and Eve rebelled against God, we are sinners too and we rebel against God and that relationship is broken. That's bad news, but that's not the worst news. The worst news is we can't fix that relationship. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. That means uh, the, what we have earned by our sin is death and we can't change that. That's depressing. That's hard. But God doesn't leave us there. Thankfully, He gives us good news, even amongst this bad news and the worst news. God gives us good news, and the good news is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus came. He died on an old rugged cross. He, he lived the perfect life that God called us to. He died on our behalf, and, and Jesus offers us the free gift of eternal life. He offers us salvation. That's the good news, but the best news is that Jesus' offer can be applied on our account. We can know Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. We can have that relationship restored. How do we do that? We do that by faith. Faith is an odd word, but it simply means trust. I'm trusting that the seat that I'm sitting in is going to keep me off the floor. We have to place our faith. We have to trust that Jesus is who he says he is, and he did what he said he did. We have to trust that. And we have to trust that he will honor his promises, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We express that oftentimes by praying. So if you'd like to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I encourage you to pray a prayer uh, something like this, where you uh, tell God that you recognize that you're a sinner and that your sins have separated and broken that relationship with Him. 
and to tell him that you're sorry and, and to realize that Jesus uh, came to be the answer. He came to, to die and to live the perfect life and to die in your place and that you are accepting, you believe that Jesus did that. And you want his death to be applied to your account. You want the forgiveness of your sins. And you want to follow Jesus in obedience the rest of your life. If you've made that decision, would you reach out to us? Would you email us at info at brushyforkbaptist.com or contact us on Facebook? We'd love to hear that you've made a, a commitment to follow the Lord. God bless.